We are in the cir same circumstance. We find ourselves in the same situation Paul was in. Now, you know that uh, Paul, when he, was with the, with, when he was with the brethren, with the saints, he was gentle and he was meek with the saints, with the brethren. But then there was a time when he had to be bold to get, he said, bold to get some. He had to speak with frankness and he had to be bold. And he goes on to talk about how that uh, it's necessary to be bold and, and, and forthright because uh, of the situation we're in. He said we're casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's a situation that required boldness from Paul. Same situation we're in. Think of this, brethren. The, uh, the, uh, how it bring every thought under captivity. You control your mind in the way you think. What kind of circumstance are we in that requires us to take captive and bring it under obedience, our minds and our thoughts? Well, you, as you know, brethren, the scriptures are very clear about the existence of the, of the demonic world, mm -hmm. the demonic world, the forces that is in this world, the spiritual beings in the unseen realm. In many places throughout the scriptures, they speak of principalities and powers and demons and devils and evil spirits. It's an opposing force in the unseen realm. Our Lord personally confronted these things, and he overcame these powers when he was on the earth. They are the unseen dominion of power. They're under the rule of darkness. It requires us to be bold and to be disciplined in our thinking, controlling all our thoughts. We can't be uh, uh, unaware of this situation. We can't live and, and not be aware of these things. They're powers of wickedness and rulers of spiritual powers in high places. This is right out of the scriptures. And they come as, uh, as spirits of deception and deceit with doctrines of demons that promote hate and division. Do scriptures speak of these realities? They do. And in my mind, I visualize a place. I can, you can read the scriptures and you can, you can visualize a place where all these forces of wickedness kind of gather where all the self-seeking and the envy and the jealousy and strife, where there, there are found, mingled together yeah. in one place. And, and there are, you, can, you can imagine in your mind that in this place, uh, along with every other imagination and agitation, disturbance of men, you'll find the works of the flesh and the teachings of men, and the vanities of men, they're all here in this one place. They're all located here. This whole place now that I'm, I'm talking about, we can visualize in our mind, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, godless and evil. It's a, it's a breeding ground is what it is. For all the things that oppose God. See, this place is in opposition to God. It's a place that we want to avoid at all costs. Yeah. We don't want to go there. It's like a sewage pond, if you will, for iniquity. Uh -huh. A cesspool of wickedness where it all runs in one place and all gathers there. And you know, and I realize, you know, this place that you've you got in your mind at this time, it's where all the spiritual powers and where darkness, where they rule and have dominion. I could think that this place... It's the inspiration for all wickedness and evil. A place where demons and devils have their positions of power and influence. That right here, this place. Now, after I described it, you might think I'm, I'm thinking of a place like maybe like hell or something. You know, you think he's talking about hell. And, uh, but I'm not. A, a place I'm referring to is the, is the next worst place than this. Uh, I would call this place the flesh. This is where wickedness and, re and the rebellion of God breed. Yeah. Where the rulers of demons and spirituals gather. Spirits gather at this place. Now, the reason that any of this that I've just talked about, any, the, the only reason that what I've talked about warrants any mentioning 
in this, in this uh, godly uh, presentation, this lesson today, is that religious men have been so preoccupied with this place and the management of this place that they've neglected the work of God. Men are sent to school to be specially educated in order that they may become caretakers of this place. And of this number, how many of them have slipped themselves, have themselves slipped into the same bog they've been sent to manage? The facts are, and this is a burden on my heart, is the reason I bring it up. The facts are the detention and the management that's given to this place, a cesspool of the flesh, has taken its toll on the body of Christ. Men have been trained to manage the sewer plant of the flesh while the body of Christ has been neglected. And it lives in a malnourished state. The people of God have not known the greater part of the truth of what Christ has done. These things is not known among the people of God. We know that God has chosen us to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Everybody knows that this is not understood in our time. We know this. We talk about all that. But the, but the truth is, this is not understood. And it's for this reason that we don't rest talking about these things. Every time we get up, we, we make some reference, some uh, effort to bring these things and stir them up. Now, in the park where I work, there's probably 30 septic tanks. Thousand gallon tanks. That's a lot of that's a lot of septic tanks in a fifteen acre place. Yeah. And because of the nature of these tanks and what they are, they we keep them buried yeah. and we keep lids on them. We don't we wouldn't dare leave them uncovered because they are so offensive yeah. to people. Now consider, brethren, okay, I know this is a peculiar example, but the point I'm trying to make is there is six billion eight hundred people on the the greater part of seven billion people. Uh-huh on the face of the earth. Now, can you imagine the stench that this planet gives off? Just think about how wretched. It occurred to me how wretched and offensive the planet must be to the heavenly realm, to the righteousness of God. So, having this in mind, I want to uh, use this as a context by which, by where we're going to look at our text that... Uh, Sarah read. Our text comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Actually, it'll come from 18, 19, 20, 21. Now, I, uh, when I was studying for uh, this this, uh, this morning, I, I, always, I like to just read and study all of it, everything concerning this. And I guess you would call it a topic, you would, uh, studying a topic. Now, when it occurred to me that when Paul was ministering, and, and this is, uh, flies in the face of a lot what I've taught and a lot of people teach, but when Paul was ministering to the saints, and in this case, he wrote under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, particularly. Mm-hmm. He never wrote anything that did not directly pertain to his purpose of writing or speaking. Yeah. I say this because there's not great uh, passages of Scripture that you can skip because they're not relevant. Yeah. Or he got Paul digressed off the point. Or they were not culturally relevant. But, and, and we know this is not true. Because in a culture of sin, any, any, salvation is, is, is relevant. Amen. Everything that Paul said was always on track. He was always on the subject. His, view, his uh, message is not to be the viewed as like some that we hear speak today. And to get across, uh, who get up in our great assemblies across the country and they speak about uh, current events and political issues and childhood uh, experiences. Paul was an able minister. God made him an able minister. And he wrote with a, a spiritual focus. And he spoke with great plainness of speech, he said, opening up the mysteries of the things of God. Now, what Paul had to say to the Corinthians, all of it pertains to all of it pertains to all of them who have been born again. And you know, as Paul works his way into this letter, he establishes a proper view of spiritual life for the brethren. 
There's a particular focus the saints must have. It's the right way to see ourselves in regard to the purpose of God. Paul, you can read Paul's writing and you just pick it up as he just points it out to you. As I prepared for this, I studied through uh, the first six chapters up, uh, and, and this, and, it, and, and I could see where Paul, he leaves a route. He kind of like carves out a path for us to follow. It's a, it's a, it's a proper way to think about spiritual things. Amen. And I wrote a few of these things down. They were, they were, so, they were so good. You'll notice, you'll see more of these uh, in your own studies. But in chapter 1, Paul talks about trials and afflictions. They're not just for us. They're for the whole body of Christ. Although the circumstances and the, and the degrees of uh, trials and suffering are different, but they're, but they're for each individual, they're for them, but they're for the whole body of Christ. Paul declared that our, our, our afflictions are for the salvation of the body and for the comfort and consolation are also for the salvation of the body. And the saints are to be to God a sweet fragrance of Christ. There's an aroma that arises from the earth. It's a sweet fragrance of the Lord. We are, we're also a sweet fragrance of Christ one to another, he says, to those who are being saved. And by the same token, we are a fragrance to those who are perishing, and our fragrance to them is that of death or a dead body. The experience of salvation, he says, is that we're all being transformed in chapter 3. We're changed into the image of Christ as we behold his glory as revealed in the scriptures. It is God who shines the light of the knowledge of Christ to our hearts and to our dark and ignorant hearts, Paul said. It's just as God commanded the light to shine in creation, he shines it in our hearts at, at that point. In this day of salvation, God has turned the light on, Paul says. There's a great light shining in the presence, in the person of Jesus Christ. God has allowed Satan to blind the hearts of men so they can't see the light, Paul says. In this same chapter, Paul reminds us abundant grace of God. And our new man has been renewed day by day, even though our outward man, our physical man, is wearing out. Paul finishes the fourth chapter by saying the things we can see are temporal, and are perishing, he reminds us. The things we cannot see are eternal and last forever. So he says then, so we look not at the things which are seen, but rather we look at the things we see not. The saints groan, Paul said. They groan being burdened with this earthly body and a, and a body that loves the world and a world that we've rejected. We groan. The burden also comes from the desire for our new bodies which God has purposed for us to have. We're anxious to put them on. In the fifth chapter, Paul makes this affirmation, the newness of life in Christ. Can you see where he's going with this? And, he get, and when, he get, when we get to our text, his, his, his newness of life, as, call, as Paul defines it, is living unto the one who died for them and rose again. The evidence of new creatureship, all things are passed away, and behold, all things are new. In verses 18 through 21, Paul makes three more observations, and this will form our text around this. And it kind of, it's a kind of a high point here in the fifth chapter. He says, all things are of God. And then he says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And then he says that he might, well, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be the made the righteousness of God in him. Now, Paul reached a high point here. And he begins, when he begins, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now, about any time you, you speak of these things, the salvation, you've reached a high point, I understand. But this, Paul has worked his way from chapter 1 to this particular point he's going to make. Now, the abundant work of salvation, that is, understanding the work of salvation, comes to a man when he understands the flesh. The real truth, when you understand the real truth of the nature of the flesh. Then you begin to, to see why man needed redeeming, why, why redemption and reconciliation was so important. It's only when you could properly, when you can put flesh in its proper place, that you're able to understand the need that we for peace with God concerning sin. Before you understand, in order for God to bless man in any way, man first had to be reconciled to him. Yeah. Now, the reason I chose to open up uh, 
describing humanity as a, like a, as, a, as a cesspool of iniquity, is to stress man's total unacceptable condition to God. Matter of fact, you can see like that God was trying to keep the lid and keep man covered up for so many years because they were just so, you got to see this. Uh, we bring the remembrance of flood. The flood, we bring the remembrance. The flood was because of the flesh, brethren. It was flesh that God removed from the face of the earth. I think a true, de- a true description of the condition of all men can be seen in what Jesus told the Pharisees. He told them something that can't be said of, all, of most men. Jesus told them, on the outside, you look pretty good. On the outside, they appeared beautiful. But on the inside, they were not pretty at all, you remember. For he said, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within, full of dead men's bones, all uncleanliness. And this is just about the best can be said for even the finest of men. The inscription reads, over the very best of men's efforts, on the outside you look pretty good, but on the inside you're full of death and uncleanliness. Now verse 18, Paul says, all things are of God, which, which includes the nature of men. Though the nature of man is vile and reprehensible, it's not outside the control of God. All things are of God. God is in control. For our very condition has been according to his purpose all along. When he said in Isaiah, Behold, I will do a new thing, or behold, I, I will do a new thing, a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now it springs forth, shall you not know it? If God were not entirely in control and truly sovereign, he couldn't declare this ahead of time Amen. and make it happen. If, this, if, if these things were not true, uh, God couldn't, couldn't turn a cesspool and the living water. God reconciled, if, 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 if this was not true, that all things are of God, God couldn't reconcile the world to himself. From heaven's point of view, the need for salvation was something that was put into motion by God. All things are of God will be made manifest to all creatures in the matter of, in, in the matters of salvation then. There isn't anything about salvation at all that comes from men. He creates a need for salvation. He creates the means for salvation, and he draws men to it. Now, we will look more at the need for salvation then. God will not do what many men are willing to do. He will not receive those who are not like himself. He, He just will not do it. Flat out won't do it. It's simply not right for God to associate and receive those who are not like himself. And, we're, and, and, and not being like him, you understand, we're talking about the nature of God. That his particular nature being then, that his righteous nature is what we're talking about in this particularly. And, and you know there's more to it than man's inability to please God in righteousness. There's this, this, this natural presence of rebellion in men's flesh. It's this a hostility towards God that's there. It's about a nature that doesn't even want to please God. It's about a nature that opposes God, outwardly opposes God, and one that cannot please God. It's a nature of unrighteousness, which is at odds with the nature that is righteous. Well, I don't know a better exposition of this whole subject as when Paul picks it up, this subject, when he picks it up, concerning the weaknesses of the flesh in the 8th chapter of Romans. does a and the first 14 verses contain some of the greatest insights about the weakness of the flesh. I just plain talk about the carnal mind and the spiritual. We must remember, too, when Paul is speaking, he's speaking to, to uh, brethren who have been reconciled to God. When he said there's no condemnation in verse 1 to those who walk after the spirit and not to the flesh, he's speaking to brethren. And uh, it says also, brethren, he makes a statement to in verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the flesh, a spirit, the things of the spirit. And that these things are written to believers. It's even more particularly stunning when you see what Paul has to say about the flesh. 
why Paul would spend so much time explaining the nature of it. Paul refers to the expression of the flesh as, uh, as the carnal mind and the mind of the flesh. It, that's the expression of it. When you, you, how do I see the flesh in a person? I, I see it through their, it's visible through the mind of the flesh and their outward carnal nature. He tells him in verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is peace and life. And he goes on to say, the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Paul sums it up in verse 8 then. This is a concluding remark in verse 8. He says, for this reason, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. What Paul has to say here, he says to all flesh. Flesh that is not reconciled to God. And flesh that belongs to those who've been reconciled to God. I've never seen this before. To be carnally minded, in verse 6, to be carnally minded and to be spiritually minded, the possibilities of those exist only in those who've been born again. The only they can be both. There's, there's where the tire meets the, uh, the, uh, the rubber meets the road there. Those outside of Christ cannot be spiritually minded. They are only carnal. They're dead, dead to God. All things are God, particularly concerns reconciliation then. It's a point we want to make. Now we know that to be reconciled to God is to be made at peace with Him. We had to be at peace. That means that all hostilities have been removed then. So a change has been taking place. That there's been a change taking place that allows a person to be in agreement with God and man. That we couldn't be in agreement with him before. To be reconciled to God means that we're in agreement with God now. He, what he wants to do, we want to do. Amen. You have to ask yourself then, am I in agreement with God? Yeah. Now let that be an affirmation to you. Yeah. Does this sound good to me? Or does it, uh, or does it have, do you have a problem with it? Then you say, well, am I in agreement with God or not? Of course, the change that took place does not come from God, for God does not change. He cannot change. So it's man who was changed. Yeah, this change is reflected in verse 21, back in the chapter where our text is found, in the fifth chapter of St. Corinthians. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here is the change. That we might be made. It's talking about the new man which is created in righteousness and true holiness in Ephesians 4. We were made. He is the righteousness of God. He is the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. This is the same new man that Sarah read in the scripture shower. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He's the righteous one. And it, says, and it is the fulfillment of, of Isaiah 43. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now, man certainly cannot change himself. Man, if there's any change that took place, and we had to we had to say this fairly often, man didn't do the changing. Man can't change. God changed men. God's doing the changing. And it took place when we're reconciled to him. Part of our text, 21, Paul writes, Be ye reconciled to God. Paul is telling this to believers, believers who are already reconciled to God. He is, Paul is pleading with those who have always been, all, you can sense that he's pleading with them in, this, in the context of the scripture. He's pleading with those who have already been reconciled. Be reconciled to God. This word of reconciliation is for those who are not at peace with God, regardless of their profession. They be reconciled to God. This is the exhortation that Paul has given. Be reconciled to God. Now, this makes perfect sense to those who understand about the inward struggle that belongs to everyone who prefers the things of God rather than things of this earth. We can understand be reconciled to God because those who have an eye for heaven, they realize the tension and the opposition which comes from the flesh to, bring, to draw our attention back to the earth. The flesh, which cannot change, nor is it willing to change, uh -huh. even though it, res it resides right next to a, a partakers of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. 
be reconciled to God is a forward call Amen. to increase and to advance. It is a call from Paul to the brethren there to move in, move in closer, and obtain the prize for the high calling in Jesus Christ. In the first verse of the next chapter, which we won't go to, of course, but Paul will, Paul will tell them, don't receive the grace of God in vain, or don't be as those who receive the, the grace of God in vain. So you see, you can pick it up there what, Paul, what Paul's mind was when he was speaking to them. We, we have been reconciled in order that we might be saved. I will not consider myself saved. I will not consider myself saved until I've crossed the finish line or until I've crossed over Jordan or if I've entered the promised land or until I've obtained the full inheritance. I can't consider myself saved then. I'm in a position to be saved. I want to stay reconciled to God. Romans 5.1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we see how we're at peace with God. This, of course, is speaking of, of men in a reconciled state. Now, reconciled to God, that is where we want to stay. Amen. We want to stay there. Paul tells the brethren so many words, stay put, in other words. He's, and it's another way of staying, stand fast. Uh, stand firm. I want to stay in a place where I'm pleasing to God. I want to walk in the Spirit, having the mind of the Spirit, crucifying the flesh, mortifying the deeds of the body. I want to be at peace with God. See, that's where he put me. Living with an awareness of God comes from being at peace with him. You can't live with, in an, outside of, you can't live in an awareness of God and not be at peace with him. In the matter of reconciliation, God has even given us a word for reconciliation. He's given us reconciliation, and he's given a message, and he's given a word for reconciliation. And this word of reconciliation reconciles us to God and empowers us to stay reconciled. It is the word of the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, the record of his son. And it's in this place now that God wants us to stay put. And Paul says, be not moved away from the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free, and not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. This is the work of reconciliation. I don't want to be where somebody's not preaching to me, teaching to me, talking to me about the word of reconciliation. Does it make sense for me to be that I want to be reconciled to God and I'm going to have company with or I'm going to listen to someone that's not talking about reconciliation? Does that make any sense at all to you? It didn't to me either. The us. Well, let me read the first verse, the scripture first. In verse 21, I'm going to read again. It says, for he hath made us to be sin. Now, the us in this verse is all the saints. You know, there's a view out there that when things are just a really hard to attain to when they're talking about be ye perfect for I am perfect be ye holy for God is holy there's a tendency for people to say well this is for the apostles he's really speaking the us there is they and we and he's really talking about the group of the apostles or some of the more ex uh, some of the more bre uh, other brethren who were excelling in the things of God but brethren you know and I know that he's talking this is a word for all the saints here Okay. This is for everybody. And this, this is really does a good thing. We can all do this. For as many of you, okay, as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Everybody puts on Christ. Everybody is reconciled to him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now, isn't it interesting there that the Apostle John says, let no one deceive you? And this, on this good word, will there be men that will come along and try to tell you something different than this? Well, sure, there's men coming along. Men will come and say, you're righteous because you do righteous. Okay? But, but their take on is a little bit different. 
okay? They're saying that you're righteous because you're able to do righteous, and, and my attainment for righteous things will make me righteous. And it's all a, it's all a shift of the effort all on the flesh again, see? But see, now that's, what John, that's not what the apostle John is saying. He's saying that the reason you're able to do righteous things, of course, is because you've been made righteous. Now, all those who've been baptized in Christ have put on the Lord. And you've been reconciled and have been brought into peace with God. Now, you are, can be, when he says be ye perfect, you can be perfect and you can be holy in that sense. In Romans 4, Paul talks about justification and righteousness. Paul makes a point in the first few verses right off the bat. Abraham was not justified in the sight of God by what he did, but Abraham was justified by faith. Now to someone who works, I'm reading scripture here. Now to someone who works, Paul says, wages are not considered a gift, but an obligation. However, to someone who does not work, but simply believes in the one who justifies the ungodly, faith, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. The scriptures say that Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. And then the question is asked, under what circumstances was righteousness credited to Abraham? Was it while he was already circumcised? Or was it before he was circumcised, before he'd done anything? In other words, is what he's saying. Righteousness, the scripture says, was reckoned to Abraham before he was circumcised. And circumcision was given as a seal of Abraham's righteousness that he received by faith. Circumcision didn't make Abraham righteous before God. Man can't do anything to make things right between him and God. We do learn here that righteousness follows our faith. And the work of circumcision followed after that, after we were made righteous. Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that God had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore that was imputed to him for righteousness. This was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but also for ours, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification, is for us. Our faith in Jesus Christ and the redemption that is found in him brings righteousness to us. All the work of the Spirit to bring us to maturity in Christ is taking, the, is taking place in the context of our reconciliation, in the context of our righteous standing before God. Our righteousness then, that will be the part that will inherit that new glorious body that's been prepared for us. At the present time, we are being conformed into the image of his son. Mm -hmm. Paul says we're being changed from one stage of glory to the next. In the, not, in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, we are actually being saved right now. Salvation is not a mere formality. Yeah. You understand this. We don't just recognize a, something and then we follow it. Actually, we participate in salvation. Yeah. For decades, salvation, for the great majority, has been, uh, has been no more than just joining a local church mm -hmm. and half-heartedly trying to do good and following after the teachings. But what does salvation sound like to our brethren here? In the scriptures. How about listen to Paul and Peter when they speak about salvation? Here's Peter. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's Peter's version on salvation. Paul, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so I fight, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body. And bring it under subjection, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself be a castaway. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, I count them as dung, that I may win Christ. This is salvation, according to Paul, to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, Amen. but that which is through the faith of Jesus Christ. The righteous, 
which is of God by faith, Paul says. And then he goes on to say, that I, then here's, here's the end result of salvation, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Salvation, then, is not a spectator sport, is it? Today, men gather in our great coliseums every Lord's Day, and they, they watch the preacher to perform some sense of some salvation for them. Paul said, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And this is precisely the condition that Christ found men when he came into the world. They, they could not please God. But that's not the way he left them. When, God, when Christ left the world, he didn't leave them this way. Christ brought life and immortality to, to man. Paul says it this way. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So in Isaiah 43, behold, I do a new thing. Then we see what God meant by that. We can see that. Things had become new. When uh, the situation was that uh, man could please God, today men can please God. So will there be any, any, any occasion for an excuse on the final day? No, there won't be, because men can please God in Jesus Christ. They can come to him. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord Say so, Amen. whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Thank you, brethren.